My name is Kristina Prokopovich, and I am the curator of the Ukrainian Heritage Museum at Manor College. This month, our Artifact of the Month is a set of books that were printed as a report to Congress from the Commission on the Ukraine Famine. They were donated by Mrs. Ulana Mazurkevich. Mrs. Mazurkevich is sitting here with me and um, she has been very active in the Ukrainian community, not just in the Philadelphia area, but throughout the United States and in Ukraine. She founded the Ukrainian Human Rights Commission Committee, which defended dissidents in Ukraine, tried to get human rights for Ukrainians. She is the president of the Ukrainian Community Committee of Philadelphia, which is commonly known as the Hromatsky Komitet. Hromada in Ukrainian means community. And most importantly, and why she's here today, she was a member of the United States Congressional Commission on the Ukraine Famine of 1932-33. Welcome to the Thank Ukrainian you. Heritage Museum. Thank you. Christina. Can you tell us a little bit about the Holodomor and how you got involved with working with the Commission? Now, uh, first of all, when you hear the word Holodomor, um, people that are not Ukrainian uh, do not understand what does this mean. And it's a combination of two words. Holod in Ukrainian means starvation and more in Latin is death. So it's death by starvation, and um, we now call it uh, the Holodomor, and it's become part of the lexicon. If you go into any dictionary, Google it, you'll come up with Holodomor, the artificial famine that occurred in Ukraine in 1932-33, and between 8 and 10 million suffered this ungodly death. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you got involved with the commission and your work with trying to bring awareness to the Holodomor here in the United States? Well, what happened, um, there was an individual living in New Jersey. His name was Ihod Olshanyuski, and he was an activist. And he came up with the idea that the 50th anniversary of Holodomor was coming up of this genocidal famine, and he said, wouldn't it be a great idea to set up a commission in Congress to study this? I mean, it sounded uh, quite uh, fantastical and quite unreal, but the more we thought about it, we thought, hey, this could be accomplished. So there was a lot of lobbying. We contacted our senators, our congressmen, asking them to set up this commission. We had the Ukrainian newspaper, uh, Svoboda, and Ukrainian Weekly, which is published in the States. And they wrote articles in support, and they asked people to lobby for it. And uh, all the organizations in the United States got on this bandwagon, and we pushed for it. Thank goodness that uh, the Ukrainian Human Rights Committee, which I am president of, and which was very, very active, had many friends in Congress. We would basically go to Washington at least twice a month for, to lobby for Ukraine, for human rights in Ukraine, and then also for freedom for Ukraine, because the ultimate task was that Ukraine would become an independent country. But there were steps to follow. First, we had to get our political prisoners out of prison and make sure that the problem that Ukraine was suffering was known to the world. And we had, um, serving on the commission, we had two senators, four congressmen, five public members, a representative from um, the presidential office, and um, the Surgeon General. That was really an unbelievable setup. And to think that at that point, when the commission was set up, they 
the Congress put up $400,000. In today's money, it is a million dollars. A million dollars was set up for a two-year mandate, plus they gave us room in Congress. Congressional office was provided for the commission to do its work. The um, managing director of the commission was Dr. James Mace. Um, a wonderful, wonderful man, had nothing to do with Ukrainians, absolutely nothing. The only thing he had to do with the Ukrainians is that he went to Harvard and the history of Ukraine and Ukrainians attracted him. And uh, that's all that, no, you, he wasn't Ukrainian, he wasn't American, he was a Native American, which gave the commission um, like an international flavor. Here you have the director of the commission being a Native American, and um, you have the senators from, what well, one of the senators was Senator Brian Dorgan, who was absolutely wonderful. He was from the state of um, North Dakota. And the reason he was chosen was because a lot of, uh, quite a majority, well, not majority, but I don't even know how many thousands of people were Ukrainian that settled in Dakota because they were, they were farmers. And this was farm country. They could grow wheat. The temperature was similar to the temperature in Ukraine. And uh, so that was his um, constituents. And um, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, the work you did, the oral histories? Oh. So then once we got our mandate, um, we started collecting witnesses. Now, it is very frightening for many Ukrainians who emigrated to the United States. They were afraid to speak and give their story. Understandably so. Right. They were afraid that the KGB would come knocking on their doors, mm -hmm. that their families would suffer. So many uh, testified under pseudonyms. Uh, that was the, when we collected uh, a thousand uh, oral testimonies. And we had 28, I believe it was 28 uh, witnesses that came to Congress. And when they came to Congress, they were sworn in, they raised their hand, as you would do in any court, and they testified to the events that they lived through and that they experienced. And we had hearings throughout the United States. We had um, a fantastic hearing here in Philadelphia, and it was at the um, federal court. We were lucky to get the federal court. We had reporters from um, the court sitting there taking down notes. And uh, a dear, dear friend and a member of the commission, Congressman Benjamin Gilman, whose constituents reside in Glens Bay. So, large Ukrainian community. That's right, there. a large Ukrainian community. <laughs> and yeah. so he made sure that he, would, he came to our hearing. Mm -hmm. So he took part in the hearing. And I remember there were three of us sitting on top, you know, just like judges do. I was sitting together with um, Congressman Benjamin Gilman, and there was another commissioner, Anastasia Walker, and I. And uh, people would come up and swear and um, give their stories. But that, that was, uh, I was so happy. Then we had hearings also in San Francisco, hearings in um, um, Arizona, uh, hearings in Chicago, and all of this was collected and, coll and um, put into our, our collection of our, the mandate that we had to collect uh, the historical eyewitness report. But then we had a lot of uh, eyewitness, uh, witnesses show up and uh, we would just um, record them. Mm -hmm. So they did not come in front of the commission. Just they did recorded. not testify. Right. They recorded for the record. So we have, um, I think it was a thousand of witnesses collected on discs. And so this was all 
published eventually in this set of four books that you were yes. kind enough to donate here, yes. and they are available in the Manor Library. Yes. But also, uh, as I understand, some of the report was translated into Ukrainian oh, yes. and published, and I think that's oh my the God. book you have right there. Yes, let me show that to you. In, um, the commission finished its mandate. The report was given to Congress, and the commission, the United States Congress, accepted that the famine of 1932-33 was genocide. No one else at that point had stated that, but the United States government accepted this statement and said, yes, the famine mm -hmm. of 1932-33 was a genocide against the people of Ukraine. And that is very important because on the basis that the U.S. Congress recognized it as a genocide, we were able to get resolutions in various states to commemorate the dates of the Holodomor mm -hmm. because we had that basis on which to go. Now, what happened after the, uh, 10 years later, after the mandate expired, I um, went to my uh, Senator Dorgan, who is absolutely wonderful. They all are because they were so, I mean, they were, I have to say that, I mean, they sat at the hearings, especially in Washington, and they listened to the stories mm -hmm. of the witnesses. And you cannot imagine how they felt when they heard the stories. I, mean, I have to just, one story that was really quite poignant, and it had to do with a reporter that Serap is in a very circumvented way came to Kiev. And in fact, at that time, you could not enter Kiev. Kiev was blocked off. Mm -hmm. The borders were sealed. No one can get out. No one could come in. And um, the reason they were sealed is because Stalin launched, as we call the Holodomor, this major genocidal famine where, seven, where eight to 10 million died. And how are you gonna keep this quiet? How can there be eight million to 10 million dying in a country that was called the breadbasket of Europe? Mm -hmm. How do you keep it quiet? How do you keep it? What do you do? You seal the borders of Ukraine. You cannot have anybody enter or leave. No one could get in, no one could get out. Some reporters did in a way, get in. And their stories came out where um, they said that they're running, they're seeing bodies lying like kindling wood on, on roadways mm -hmm. and big trucks coming along, picking these skeletons and dumping it into communal graves. They said they saw children walking around with, you know, by themselves, just wandering wandering, bloated tummies, and just searching because their parents had died. And uh, the, um, the reporters, when they wrote this, they were kind of negative people saying, yeah, we know something like that is going on. But then we have this correspondent in New York, from New York. New York Times. Yes, New York Times. The major correspondent, foreign correspondent from the world's most important international newspaper, right. the New York Times. Mr. Right. Walter Durante. Yes, the infamous Walter Durante. Yes. And he kept writing, what famine are we speaking about? There is no famine. Mm -hmm. He I saw, I visited, there's nothing like that. And um, in the meantime, he never went to any village, he never moved out of Moscow. He was enjoying his life to the best of the money that Stalin gave him. He was being paid by Stalin to yeah. push his things because in this time period, Stalin was pushing his five-year plan, how great the Soviet Union is doing. And uh, so he had to uphold Stalin, whatever Stalin wanted. He would basically give him the information 
and Walter Durante, the major correspondent, foreign correspondent of the New York Times, said no famine. Stalin told him no yes. famine. Durante repeated no famine. So the other reporters that brought this out, just like Garth Jones for them from the Manchester, all of a sudden, you know, he came into Ukraine, he saw this, he saw the tragedy, he wrote about it, he sent it to the newspapers. Right. Durante knocked him down, kept, kept saying, what do you know? I am the correspondent from the New York Times. I have been in this business for decades. You are only 27 years old. You have been as a reporter only, I think, for like not even two years. <laughs> So he knocked him down, knocked him down, and uh, propagated the lie, the lie that there is no famine. In the meantime, words did get out, and even the Holy See, the Vatican, was sending dispatches, and we have that all documented in our books, saying, what is going on? There's famine. All the embassies were writing about this, and then you have this New York Times saying, no, no, no. And uh, then when someone wanted to visit a village, saying that they're knocking on uh, Moscow's door and saying, please, we have to see what Stalin and Moscow did. They set up these Potemkin villages. They set up a village that was like a Hollywood scene. Mm -hmm. Everybody's happy, right. everybody's chubby, everybody's dancing, singing. Life is good. Mm. Yes. And uh, that's, um, that's that um, awful, awful story that, that was propagated. But speaking of Senator Dorgan now from North Dakota, he... Um, when I came to him and I said, you know, we did this great work. We published four books, four there, plus, it's not, it's only Report to Congress, plus the Oral History Project. So we have four reports, and this is all the witnesses that uh, testified, not um, orally, but not physically um, present at the uh, recording. recording, right? And so I said to Senator Dorgan, you know, we have this. It's in the Congressional Library. People could get that, but the people of Ukraine don't really know. Wouldn't it be a great gift to the Ukrainian people to go and publish, first of all, translate all this into Ukrainian, and then publish it mm -hmm. in Ukraine and present it to the people of Ukraine. And he said, great idea, let's do it. He said, because when we started our work, he said, no one knew about the famine. Right. No one knew that this was genocide. And he said, this will be great, let's do it. So Senator Dorgan went to the um, various uh, committees in the Congress. Actually, he served on Appropriations Committee. And uh, 100,000, right? It was 100,000 that was given for this project. Now, this was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I went and if you convert it into dollars again, it would be probably 200,000. But can you imagine how great the United States is that they would go set up the commission and after the mandate of the commission they went and they published the work of the commission the work of the commission we have four books like that and each book is a thousand pages the most beautiful thing is i have to show you in when you open the book and you go in there, there is this saying, and it says, if you can read it, it says, with the friendship of the people of the United States of America. I mean, 
it, it, it brings tears to my eyes. This is what America is about. What a beautiful country to do this. And Especially with the people of Ukraine being under Soviet rule for so many years, they didn't know about it. And uh, it's only since the fall of the Soviet Union that all the documents have been able to be researched and information has gotten out. So it is wonderful that the United States that did this. That the United States, with the friendship of the people of the United States of America. But we, did, we didn't stop at this because every year we commemorate the anniversary of the Holodomor, the, Ar the artificial genocidal famine. And we even do it here in Manor. Yes, we do. Every year in November, we commemorate the Holodomor. Worldwide, November 28th is commemoration of the Holodomor. And would be really nice if anybody who can would just light a candle and to commemorate and say a prayer for the many people who starved to death at, during the Holodomor. The, um, we had some wonderful commemorative um, programs that we were doing in Philadelphia and are still doing to bring awareness to the um, Holodomor. And I love this action that we had I don't know if you can focus on it. This was outside by the Liberty Bell. And we have, we have a couple, what was school it? Children. We have school children. We have uh, the sisters. Sisters, and the archbishop is there, and the mayor. And uh, it was wonderful. And what they did it, here we had a dance. This was at the People's uh, Park where you have uh, the um, Liberty Bell and uh, the um, Independence Hall. And we had a dance, and it was a dance of, of life and death. And um, so you had um, the school children, and they were dancing. And uh, at first it showed that a mother was a little child is searching for bread, and she can't find any bread. And later on, she does, and it, it, the angels come out, and just the goodness reigns. And, and here is, um, we have a lot of proclamations that were given by the city of Philadelphia and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And here we see, uh, yes, uh, Nutter, Mayor Nutter, in City Hall, and with one of our proclamations. And, um, oh, and here is a photo of Senator Dorgan. We presented him with the um, published copy that was in Ukrainian and in English. I mean, from uh, translated from English. And this is our ambassador, Ukrainian ambassador to the United States. Ambassador Shamshir, and um, we gave the um, Senator Dorgan from the commission a copy of these books so that he would have it, since he was the spirit behind this. I would like to mention that, um, as you said, for many years no one knew what the Holodomor was, no one had heard of the famine. There has been a lot of work done in trying to bring the curriculum to the school so that children can learn about it, so that something like this can never happen again. We'd like to think that with social media and the internet, the news would get out faster, but who knows, the internet can be shut down too. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to mention is if there are many books written about the Holodomor, both in Ukrainian and in English, but if someone would like to learn the basics and not have to sit there and read a long book, just get an idea of what it was. There are many, there are now several films. And as Ulana mentioned about the reporters that did get in, there are two films right now. One is the Rea Kleiman story, and it's uh, called The Hunger of, for Truth. And it is the story of a woman reporter who did get in and was able to report on it. 
Uh, we had a showing of the film here a few years ago with the director. There is also currently another uh, film called Mr. Jones, which is about Gareth Jones, the reporter from the Manchester who reported. And um, that is available uh, on Prime to watch. We also have a copy of it here at the museum. So if you'd like to learn more about the Hula de Mar, please visit the museum, visit the library.